Sub-Saharan Africa faces escalating debts and hurdles in meeting climate goals outlined in the Paris Agreement and the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The region's external debt has more than tripled since 2008, making it a hotspot for debt sustainability issues. By 2021, total external debts reached $539.1 billion. Now, this debt is distributed among various creditors, with 40% owed to bondholders, 28% to multilateral development banks, and 11% to China. A significant portion of government revenue, averaging 12%, is allocated to debt servicing, while countries like Angola, Zambia, Benin, and Ghana will allocate over 25%. Additionally, Sub-Saharan Africa's debt servicing costs closely match annual climate finance needs, posting a challenge for sustainability efforts. Joining me now to look at debt distress and climate resilience development in Sub-Saharan Africa is Dr. Marina Zucker Marquis. She's an economist and postdoctoral research fellow uh, with the University of London. She's also the co-author of Africa's Inconvenient Truth that looks exactly at this subject. Marina, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So looking at sub-Saharan Africa's debt distress and the levels we've seen, many are saying it's in large part a function of external shocks of which the region has really no control. Beyond the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, what else has had an impact on the continent from outside and just how much damage has really been done? Yes, indeed. Uh, our study shows that Africa is bearing the brunt of a crisis that it, it has not created. So apart from the COVID and the, the war in Ukraine, we identified two main drivers. The first one is economic and the second is environmental. So from the economic point of view, since last year, advanced economies have tightened uh, their economic policy, uh, monetary policy. It means that they have increased uh, their basic interest, interest rates. So for instance, in the US, currently the basic interest rate is above 5%. It means that not only the cost of capital is higher for all countries, uh, especially developing countries and uh, sub-Saharan Africa, but also the availability of funding is scarce because there was a capital um, flow back to advanced economies. So uh, countries in Africa, they are seeing a very low liquidity in the market, which is very hard to get funding for things that you, know, you need to invest. Apart from that, we also see the climate change that is now clear to everyone that is impacting Africa more than any other region. Um, last, year in, last year in Nigeria, you have the, the, uh, one of the worst floods uh, seen in a decade, and it has and the, the impact of climate change is, in, is increasing in frequency and also the, the impact, right? So we know that today about already about 5% of GDP uh, in Africa annually has been, you know, diverse to because of climate change. And it not only means that it has, you know, when you have a climate uh, disaster, uh, at the moment we have a very uh, impact in people's life. And after a while, we have increase of poverty, we have an economic uh, impact in balance of payments and inflation, so on and so forth. So what we see here is that uh, if you put all the aspects together, the economic and the environmental, it means that if Africa does not have a comprehensive debt relief combined with new liquidity sources and uh, new grants and constitutionality uh, lending, uh, it's not going to be able to reach the SDG goals and the Paris Agreement commitments that it has done. It's interesting to hear that, especially as we know on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly 78th meeting, there's also the SDG conversation happening. And with about seven or so years to go, it seems very obvious that the world itself overall is struggling. But then that struggle seems a bit different and deeper here on the continent. So given the dire nature of the situation, let's look at the little fiscal space that countries in this region seem to have to play with. And when we talk about fiscal space in relation to how it affects sub-Saharan African countries and their ability to meet their external debt obligations, as well as their commitments under the Paris Agreement and the UN uh, 2033 uh, SDGs, what's the reality we're looking at here? So the reality that we found in, the, in our study is that roughly uh, the, the expenditure that Africa would need to face climate adaptation is roughly the same of the amount they are spending in, in, in interest payment and servicing external debt. 
So as you mentioned before, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 12% of government uh, revenues is targeted to, to service the external debt. And for some countries like Angola, uh, Zambia, th this is, you know, every $10 uh, that you pay uh, as tax revenues, about $3 goes to, to serve external debt. It means that we are seeing now that Africa is trapped in a debt and climate vicious, vicious, cycles, vicious cycle, and it has to choose between servicing its, its debt and paying uh, external uh, and in servicing its population and reaching the climate goal. So I think for us, it's very clear that we need to break the cycle. And part of break, breaking the cycle is to have a comprehensive debt relief effort. So, uh, and comparing with other regions, this, the, the situation of Sub-Saharan Africa is especially concerning because in the last 10 years, we see that uh, while other regions also are facing increasing uh, pressure from, from that sustainability, uh, Africa is especially um, vulnerable. So some data on that sustainability that we have is that from the last 10 years, uh, countries in, in, in uh, Latin America, countries in developing countries in Asia, uh, more or less they, the, the expenditure in, in servicing interest rate increased about 1% of government revenues. But in the case of Africa, it's about 10%. Wow. So more and more, um, African leaders who need to choose between defaulting their, their creditors or servicing the needs of their population. And, and that's really just a staggering uh, statistic there. But let, let's expand that a little bit more, because when we look at the significant share of government spending on external debt servicing, especially for African economies, and you're putting it at about 10 percent, what are the potential consequences we're looking at when we look at this in terms of uh, sub-Saharan African countries and their ability to invest in climate and development goals? Yeah, we know now that uh, according to some estimations, about 10% of Africa's GDP should be targeted to, uh, to meet climate uh, adaptation needs. And if you have competing um, uh, resources and you have an, an international monetary system that does not allow countries to easily uh, goal for a debt relief effort, it's very complicated because it's a matter of, of urgency for everyone, and especially for Africa that needs, uh, that is a combination of need to develop, need uh, needs to meet the, the climate change uh, adaptation needs. So um, it's really important that the priority goes to meeting this uh, climate and um, and socially important uh, uh, investment needs. So let's go further into that. So the research work that you carried out in Africa's Inconvenient Truth, you point out the need for a multilateral development bank to participate in comprehensive debt relief. Uh, we know that oftentimes it's China that is held over the fire when it comes to the debt and the sub-Saharan re uh, African region situation. Should China be really getting the criticism it really is getting? Or what should we be expecting from these multilateral development banks or institutions for them to do differently if they really want to help African countries? Because when we also look at the situation, I just had a conversation about Ghana. The IMF is giving, has given another $3 billion loan, 17th time the country has gone to the IMF. We also have Zambia and the ongoing renegotiation of its external debts as well. Everybody hasn't fully come to the table. So what are the expectations? Should China get the criticism it's getting? Should we expect more from these multilateral development banks and partners who we also owe a large amount of debt to? Thank you for this question. So regarding China, uh, I think we have to put everything into, into perspective. Uh, China is not the main uh, creditor to most of Sub-Saharan Africa's countries that need that construction. So the, the group as a whole, uh, it owns about 11%. And if you see previous uh, participation of China in that relief efforts, for instance, during the D DSSA program, there was a program during the COVID period where that service was suspended. Uh, for for official creditors. So although China was responsible for about sixty percent of um, of that stock, uh, about thirty percent of that stock, uh, China uh, contributed with sixty percent of uh, that suspension in uh, that suspension for for all creditors. So China is is contributing to to that relief efforts as well. But um, 
China is not the, the, the cause of the debt crisis now, but it needs to be part of the solution. And it's the same for the multilateral development banks. It's not that MDBs are part, multilateral development banks are part of the crisis that we are seeing now, but they need to, to, to be part of the solution. And when we see for many countries, especially for countries uh, with lower um, income levels and small island developed economies, multilateral development countries, uh, multilateral development banks are the main creditors for these countries. But multilateral developed banks, they have something that is uh, referred to um, they are, they are considered senior creditors. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a preferred credit st status, which is not something that it's a law or anything, but it's a convention that uh, countries should pay multilateral development banks first and should not negotiate their debts with multilateral development banks. But if you're a country that are relying a lot on MDBs and most of our, our debts are owned to MDBs, if you're not allowed to negotiate with multilateral development banks, you basically don't have space to negotiate. Even if all other creditors just cancel the debt, probably your debt sustainability is not to be in a level that is sufficient for you to address climate change needs. That's okay. why it's really important, although MDBs or, or China did not create the crisis we are seeing now, as we've talked before, the crisis is, is given up a multi-factor complex situation, but everybody has to contribute its share to, to, to address this question. And that's why uh, the program that I, the project that I work for, the Debt Relief uh, for a Green Inclusive Recovery Project, we uh, suggest that all players, all creditors are going to go to the negotiation table. Mm -hmm. They're going to be part of the debt relief effort. Of course, we are going to weigh differently how uh, each creditor is going to uh, bear the, the burden of losses. Uh, creditors that give more uh, expensive debt should have a higher losses because they already charged for the probability of default. So they should bear uh, higher losses uh, in this, uh, in this intercreditor burden sharing. Okay. Uh, MDBs, so, they have paid uh, more, but they should be contributing as well. Okay, Marina, last question because of time. I'll, quite, uh, I'll just want this answer very briefly. At the end of the day, debt relief is not necessarily the answer. Uh, uh, suspension of debts is not the answer. We need to fix the situation. But it's more important that we find a way for sub-Saharan African countries to strike a balance between securing that debt relief, mobilizing new financing, and then effectively implementing their commitments under the Paris Agreement and the SDGs to achieve sustainable development uh, in the region. So the question quickly I'm going to ask you is, how can they do all of this? We've seen the floods, uh, we've seen the earthquakes, we've seen the floods in Libya, in Nigeria as well, the earthquakes, we're seeing the effects of climate change wreak havoc across the continent. But we're still not necessarily seeing the financing heading in that direction because we still have to address poverty, we have to address health, we have to address education. How do we balance this very quickly? Well, I think the first step to recognize the inconvenient truth that we are referring to, we need that a comprehensive debt relief combined with more concessional and more grants from multilateral development banks, official creditors, and an effort to address the climate issues. So, uh, yes, I think in short, we need to break this virtual visual cycles that we see in sub-Saharan sub Africa. All right, Dr. Marina Zucker Marquis, economist and postdoctoral research fellow uh, with the University of London, as well as the co author of Africa's Inconvenient Truth. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we've been having ongoing conversations with you and your colleagues, and we'll continue to put the issue of death sustainability and climate resilience for the sub Saharan African uh, region on the front burner. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. And that's as much as we can take on today's Business Edge. Don't forget to follow us on social media at News Central TV and 12 p.m. West African time. You get News Central now with the latest news and information from here in Nigeria, across the continent and around the world. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Ruvalogu. Do have a fantastic day.